You are watching the Motionworks IEC Hardware Configuration video tutorial series. This video gives a light introduction to the servo options available. Hi, I'm Matt Pelletier. We have set the basic parameters to operate the servos on the demo, but you can see in the hardware configuration there are a lot more features that can be implemented. While the default is acceptable in most cases, these parameters are important when the application presents special requirements, such as fragile and expensive loads, installation in less than ideal environments, runaway conditions, vertical loads that could fall, and a host of other application concerns. Sigma 7 has the refinement to handle these applications quite elegantly. We would like you to be aware of these features, identify when each feature is used, and be able to use the manual to find the parameters involved when a particular feature is required. For this part of the training course, you will need the Sigma 7 product manual, which I'll show you how to download next. It will also be beneficial for you to have your Motionworks IEC project open from the previous video. This project we called Basic X Config, and it's okay to stay offline for this entire video. Implementing a particular parameter setting is outside the scope of this training, and will be reserved for a more in-depth study of each topic. That said, you are invited to connect to the demo and experiment on your own with any parameter setting that interests you. To get the most out of this training, you will need to download the product manual. So follow along with me and let's do that. Go to yaskawa.com and under products, go to Sigma 7 Servo, Servo Packs. Let's scroll down to the SGD7S. I'll be using this manual. The other Sigma 7 products have separate manuals, and while they are largely the same, there may be some differences. Now, scrolling down to the Documents tab, choose the Product Manual. The exact document number is SIEP S8 0000128. And you'll see that in the cover page. Let's download it. And open up that download. The front cover shows this is version H. Version H is the current version at the time of this recording. If you have a later version, you may notice a few differences. And we'll be focusing on chapters 5 and 6. I'm not recommending your PDF viewer you get to the navigation pane so you can see the different chapters. Let's start out here in chapter 5.1 with some introductory information. We call this parameter classification. Some of the parameters will take immediate effect and other parameters require a reboot. Let's spend a minute or two now in discussion of each of these topics. There are 18 topics with several parameters in each topic in some cases. Again, remember that I don't expect you to understand how to implement these but instead know that they exist and be able to find the details in the product manual. As we go along, I'll stop and review from time to time and give you a chance to do just that, to look up a parameter and find it in the manual. And the first topic is input power. Input power to the amplifier. AC or DC? Single phase or three phase? What about power interruptions or brownouts? Well, choosing between AC and DC is in section 5.3. Pretty straightforward, you got a parameter for either AC or DC. By default, in most cases, we're assuming that you'll use AC. But if you have a DC power supply, then you can connect all of your axes together with the same supply and share the DC bus. And in some cases, that will eliminate the need for regen resistors. Now, single phase or three phase parameter, also a simple setting. But just keep in mind, it's only for a short list of 200 volt AC models. So not every single amplifier even uses this parameter. If we jump down to chapter 6.2, there's configuration for momentary power interruption, basically uh, ignoring up to one second of loss of main power. Basically, this setting is a time up to one second, which allows the amplifier to ignore power losses up to that maximum time. Related to power outage is the semi F47, Semi F47 is about power brownouts or voltage drop. You can get the amplifier to limit torque when there's an under voltage condition. 
It's basically ways to keep the servo from turning off or throwing an alarm when there's a problem with the power input. Next we have some considerations for using a linear motor. The most basic one is the encoder pitch and also the phase and polarity. Chapter 5.6 is going to give you the details on that. With a linear motor you have a linear scale with lines appearing every certain number of microns. And so here we have the setting for that linear encoder scale pitch. In our tuning lab we do have a linear motor and to use that station you need to set the linear encoder scale pitch. For Yaskawa 20 micron is pretty common. 20 micron scale pitch, a setting of 2000. Next let's talk about the holding brake which is used to hold the load when the servo power is off. It's common on vertical loads, which is shown here on the right. And the motor it can be built with a brake built into the motor. The brake is not for stopping, it's for holding, like a parking brake in a car. The servo amplifier has an output labeled BK, which can be wired to an external relay. This relay is then controlled by the output of the servo, and the output of the relay would be wired to the brake, in order to apply power to the brake, releasing the brake when the servo is on. So the output energizes and the whole system releases the brake. And with the MPIEC controllers, this brake output is assigned to output number one on the amplifier's connector CN1. And the manual, section 5.12, explains that also and describes the different timing parameters and parameters that control how the brake should be applied if the motor stops during an alarm. Okay, we've gone through a few parameters, so let's have a quick review. Let's see if you can answer these questions, and please refer back to the catalog in chapter 5 and 6. So at this time, I'd ask you to please pause the video, answer the questions, and then when you resume, I'll give you the answers. Okay, parameter for DC power supply. That was in section 5.3, and the parameter is PN001. Question 2, linear motor scale pitch. That was in section 5.6, parameter PN282. And number 3, timing of the holding brake. That was in section 5.12. And for holding brake, you had to dig a little bit. And you see output timing. It's so parameter 506, 507, and 508. And for linear motors, there is a PN583. All right, three down and a bunch more to go. This next group of features all have to do with how the motor stops under different circumstances. First off is over travel, the sensors at the two ends of travel. These sensors can be enabled or disabled can change the stopping method and uh, new here in Sigma 7 you can have a warning appear in the amplifier in MotionWorks IEC hardware configuration. Most of these are in the over travel tab. Of course in the previous video we had you guys set these to off to enable the forward direction but also in this list is the emergency stop torque force and you can choose to have the motor stop that way. That is the default here. Stop with the torque set in this parameter. It's just the highest torque possible. Well, you can also choose to stop according to this other parameter, PN001, and so you choose the stopping method that best suits your application. There's a new one here also, the deceleration time. You can have a motor stop over a certain time. Of course, more details are always in the manual. This is chapter 511, over travel and related settings. And there's this new feature, over travel warning. And without over travel warning, the amplifier basically is just in an over travel state. It's not an alarm or a warning. The front panel says P and N, depending on the direction of over travel. But this will give you a warning code, which is more easily detected than by your controller. So this might be a good feature to implement. Very similar to the over travel stop is the force stop input. This allows a controlled stop in either direction with the same stopping options as we have for over travel. 
And while this is not a safety rated stop, it may be sufficient to use it in conjunction with the safety stop feature. The details are in 6.13, forcing the motor to stop. And unlike the over travel stop, you can see in the details that the servo always turns off after stop. And you need another rising edge servo on command before you get the run signal for the servo to turn on again. This is very similar to a safety stop, but it does not use redundant hardware inputs. One of the most basic options for stopping is how does the motor stop when the servo turns off during motion? If the servo turns off during motion, you obviously can't have a controlled stop with torque. So it's a choice between coasting to a stop and using what's called a dynamic brake, which is a shorting of the motor terminals through a resistor circuit that causes the motor to stop more quickly than it would with friction alone as it coasts to a stop. By default, you see that we do use that dynamic brake circuit to stop very quickly. And you might change this to a coast to a stop option if the machine stops too abruptly when the servo on signal is removed during motion. Or if you get an alarm, a dynamic brake overload alarm with larger loads and higher speeds. And keep in mind, this is not a situation that should be happening regularly. Normally, you would stop with the servo on and then turn the servo off. This option handles the case of an unexpected servo off when the machine is in motion. The servo off stop is very similar to the next stopping method called alarm stop. If the motor is moving along and there is an alarm, maybe over speed or over torque, the same options apply. You no longer have the servo on command, so you need to choose between the dynamic brake and coasting methods. However, each alarm is part of either group one or group two, Group 2 is the less severe alarms, in which case the servo does not immediately need to turn off, and therefore you can have more of a controlled stop when any Group 2 alarm happens during motion. All these details are in the manual, Chapter 5.1.3. The stopping method for alarms, with explain the Group 1 and Group 2, and this chart does a pretty good job of explaining how the different parameters are involved and all the possible options that you could have. And now finally, considering the different ways to stop, we have the safety stop feature. Safety stop is this dual hardware level inputs. This is available through a dedicated connector labeled CN8, the safety input right on the amplifier. If you don't use the feature, then you just leave the included shorting plug installed. Otherwise you buy the cable to get access to these terminals. And this is a safety rated hardware input to directly block power to the IGBTs that supply power to the motor. It would be important in your IEC code to use the global variable that's available in MotionWorks IEC. That global variable will be in your global variables list at the bottom. And for each axis, you'll see the HBB signal and that signal gives you the status of that input. The details for this one are in the manual in section 11 safety function. Let's go to 11.2. There's a lot of information in here but one of them we'll focus on is the stopping methods and you can see that this uses the same parameter parameter PN001 the same stopping method that's used for servo off stop. Let's review the parameters now for the stopping methods. Please pause the video and refer to the manual to answer these questions. And when we resume, you will hear the answers. Okay, number one, stopping method for over travel sensors, section 5.11. And the parameters are PN001 to select. And then to configure some of the methods, that was PN406, stopping with torque, and PN30A stopping with time. Stopping method for force stop is in chapter six, force stop. And this one is selected with PN00A. And depending on your selection in PN00A, you have the torque in PN406, 
and a time in PN 30A. Number three, the servo off stop method. We'll go to chapter five, 513, stopping method for servo off. And that parameter is PN 001. And looking ahead to the next question, you see that group one alarms also PN 001. But scrolling down, group number two also involves PN 00A and PN 00B. That was question number four. Number five, stopping method for safety stop. Safety stop is by itself in chapter 11. And the stopping method parameter was again PN 001. All right, we've discussed the first eight of these options and the last 10 will go pretty quick. Sigma 7 has a couple of useful options with parameters to adjust the torque overload warning level and the overload alarm level. These are in chapter 5.14, overload warning. The motor can operate continuously at its rating of 100% torque and you can go above that up to 200 and even 300 or more but the greater the overload, the less time you have before you'll get an overload alarm. So before you get the alarm, you get a warning at about 20% of that time. This parameter allows you to adjust that from, as it says an example here, 20% to 50%. This basically makes the servo either more or less sensitive to torque overloads and warning you of impending torque overloads. Now, the other one, overload alarms, remember an alarm means the servo turns off. This parameter 5.2c allows you to effectively derate the motor so that while you still get the peak 300% torque, you would not be allowed to operate at the normal 100% level continuously. You would be able to operate at some arbitrary lower level, this example 50%. You might need to adjust this level down if, as it says here, the motor heat dissipation is not sufficient. That can happen if the machine itself does not conduct heat away quickly enough. They call it the heat sink. And other conditions that may ultimately result in a motor overheat alarm. This is different than just limiting the torque because there still is the full torque range Instead, it affects the RMS, the continuous amount of torque that the motor can produce, which is directly related to the heat produced in the motor. Okay, now the next topic in the manual is the electronic gear setting. I don't want to skip over this. However, these parameters are controlled by the MPIEC controller, and they will always automatically be set both to one. Both parameters are a ratio, and they're both set one to one. So this default of 16 does not apply to the MPIEC system. The MPIEC system commands the servo in units of encoder pulses, but these parameters exist for other controllers which may not have that capability. And instead they would be programmed in what's called the reference unit. So as it says here, essentially this feature is not used by the MPIEC controller because that controller calculates the units internally. Still, these parameters are important because they define this term reference unit used by other parameters and monitors that you'll see within the system. The reference unit is always one encoder pulse when you have an MPIEC system. Next up is the absolute encoder, and we have worked with the absolute encoder quite a bit in the previous videos. We've cleared alarms A810, possibly A820, and ACC0. There's another parameter that takes a bit to discuss called the multi-turn limit, but you may have noticed that the next entire video in this series is completely dedicated to absolute encoders. So let's just hold off on this topic until the next video. Let's move on to regenerative resistor configuration. This will be important again for vertical loads. And regeneration means that the motor is generating energy rather than using energy. This happens during deceleration when you're stopping because the load can force the motor to move in the direction opposite to that in which torque is being applied. Consider this speed diagram and that this uh, vertical load would be moving downward and then stopping. So we have here the speed, it goes to a certain speed and then decelerates. Well, during that deceleration, it's going downhill, if you would, and that negative torque 
while the motor is moving forward, produces what we call regeneration, or just regen for short. Often the amplifier's capacitor can absorb this energy, but in some cases it cannot, and you'll need to connect an external regenerative resistor, for which there are two parameters. One is the rated power that should go through that resistor, and the regen resistance. How do you know if you need this? Well, our software Sigma Select, when you size the servo, will tell you how much regen resistance you need what the resistance should be and the power of that resistor. And of course, in that software, you can experiment with different speeds, inertias, deceleration rates, angles of inclination for vertical applications, and different friction levels to see how that model will affect the predicted regeneration resistor. And in the manual, that is section 5.18, regenerative resistor capacity, you see that PN600 is the wattage of not the resistor necessarily, but of the capacity of the resistor. If you read through here, you'll see that there's a 20% derating that we require for safety. And new for Sigma 7 is the parameter PN603, the resistance of that resistor in ohms. If you do have connected a regen resistor, you need to consider these parameters in order to protect both the resistor and the amplifier. Another new feature of Sigma 7 is the ability to limit the motor's speed and this applies now to not just torque mode but also speed and position mode with one parameter in rpm min minus one means rpm for rotary motors and another parameter for linear motors in millimeters per second it's a pretty straightforward parameter in section 6.4 if you exceed the speed in this parameter you get the alarm a.510 over speed alarm Next up, we have encoder pulse output. Encoder pulse output controls the feedback resolution to another device outside the MPIEC Sigma 7 system. You may want a system that monitors the feedback position of a particular axis, and it may require a certain number of pulses per rotation or pulses per distance moved and you're able to set that resolution with the parameter PN212. That controls the number of pulses produced by the amplifier in one rotation on one channel. And there are two channel outputs. They're labeled PAO, PBO, phase A, phase B. And together, those are in quadrature, which would allow the monitoring system to have even four times this resolution. Please keep in mind, this does not affect the resolution between the motor and the amplifier that will remain always at 24-bit uh, with Sigma 7, over 16 million pulses per rotation. We always have the full resolution with the MPIEC Sigma 7 system. In the manual, chapter 6.5, they call that encoder divided pulse output. There is a division operation that happens internally within the signal flow. And here you can see the details of the connector pin numbers, connections they're showing the controller here the monitoring system on the right and the motor on the left and the settings there are some limitations on the settings just based on the number of pulses per minute that those outputs can produce you can't get the full resolution out and there are some limitations and increments based on this table now for software limits it's important to point out that the software limits shown here in the manual in section 6.6, .6, software limits, these are not used by the MPIEC system. Instead, look at MotionWorks IEC hardware configuration, and under the limits tab, the controller itself has a parameter for negative and positive position limits. That's a controller parameter, not an amplifier PN parameter. And by default, these limits are enabled, but if you check out the value, it's an astronomically high value. So the idea is that you would reduce these values if you want to use the software limits, and that will keep your absolute position within this range and not allow the motor to travel outside the range that you've given. So these are completely optional because you could just rely on your programming or on the over-travel inputs themselves to keep the system within its designated area of motion.
Although the MPIC system does not use the amplifier's software limits, it does use the torque limits. Now, there's a couple options with the torque limits. There's the internal torque limits and external torque limits. Let's look to the manual at section 6.7. Torque limits are important to protect the mechanism from damage due to accidental collision. They can also be useful to temporarily control maximum torque during your process, such as, for example, tightening a bottle cap or applying a constant pressure against a workpiece. The internal torque limits shown here are always active. And these can be used for mechanical protection when you never need any more than the torque established by these parameters for both forward and reverse. For safety, you might want to set these low, and then as you run the machine, uh, turn them up until uh, the limits are just above the maximum torque you need. You can use the Sigma Win Plus Trace feature to even uh, see a graph like they show here, and trace out the performance of the motor. Now the external torque limits are torque limits that can be turned on and off with an input to the amplifier. Those inputs are labeled PCL and NCL. PCL and NCL can be set in the hardware configuration to one of the input terminals that are free. By default, those are not used. And there's more details on how these work, how to set the limits here with the PN404 and 405. And while these external torque limit inputs do work great to turn on and off a torque, it might just be easier to change the internal torque limit up and down by setting those parameters as the IEC code runs. So during execution, you can change the limit. It takes immediate effect, and that limit can be set to any value you want without using an input. Next is a feature you should be aware of called vibration detection. There will be an alarm or warning produced if there's vibration in the motor. It can really do a good job of protecting the machine from going into oscillation and vibration and doing damage to the machine. Our software SigmaWin Plus has a nice tool to set this. You set the RPMs of vibration in parameter 310 and then uh, fine tune that in with the sensitivity adjustment and uh, select whether or not you'll have a vibration alarm or vibration warning. And of course, this is all explained in more detail in chapter 611, the procedure for doing that and the parameters for setting the sensitivity. And the final option we will discuss is the motor current detection. This is a fine tuning calibration that you can do on the motor to reduce torque ripple. You probably won't see any difference in the operation. It's not normally required. There are really no parameters to adjust and it can only be done through Sigma Win Plus. That's in the next section here of the manual 6.12 adjusting motor current detection signal offset. If you were to do a trace in Sigma Win Plus of the torque signal and you find that it's oscillating, rippling, and you find that the ripple is large compared with the other servos, then you might want to try this before you try to use a tuning to get rid of that torque ripple. Okay, one final quick review, touching on just a few of the options we went over. As before, please pause the video and see if you can find the answers to these questions by using the manual. When we resume, I will show the answers. Okay, number one, derating the motor's torque below 100%. That's in section 5.14. And it's not the overload warning time, it's called detection timing for overload alarms. Parameter PN 52C is the answer. Number two, configuring the regen resistor. That's a couple sections down in 5.18. And the parameters are PN 600 and PN 603. Number three, parameter to limit motor speed. We find that one down here in 6.4, setting motor max speed. And it was parameter PN 316 for rotary and 385 for linear. And parameters to limit max torque. Max torque, we skip down here to 6.7, torque limits. With the internal torque limits set with PN 402 and 403. Active always, although they can be changed by the controller and external torque limits activated by inputs in PN404 and PN405. I hope that after all this, you'll agree with me that Sigma 7 has a parameter for just about every servo feature imaginable.
and that the descriptions and details are well documented in the product manual. I also hope you've become more familiar with the manual and that you'll keep it for reference as there are many other features and parameters we didn't even mention. If you have the time, at this point I invite you to use the remote demo to test out any of the features we talked about, set the parameter while online in the hardware configuration, save online, reboot if necessary, and see if you can verify the effect of the parameter. Otherwise, for purposes of this training, just know that the features exist and be able to look up the details in the manual. Thank you for watching this video, and remember yaskawa.com slash IEC for more information on the MPIEC product line.